Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Martha Marek, born Martha Lohnstein, was born in the year 1904 in Vienna, Austria. Her biological parents abandoned their responsibilities, which left Martha to be a foundling. Although she was adopted, her new parents were poor and life was far from extravagant. In her mid-teens, Martha got her first job in Vienna working at a dress shop. Martha initially started working at this shop in 1919, and a few years later, 74-year-old wealthy department store owner Moritz Fritsch was said to have felt bad for poor Martha and felt she was too beautiful to continue working at the shop. He decided to make her his ward, and Martha left her family to live with Moritz. The feelings Moritz had went from pity to attraction, and Moritz ended up requesting sexual encounters in exchange for the rich lifestyle. Martha was in the finest clothing, and she was also able to attend elite schools in both France and England. When Martha attended these schools, she was surrounded by the upper-class lifestyle, and even though she came from nothing, Martha's mindset was changing, and she now felt that she needed the finer things in life in order to be happy. Upon finishing school, Martha moved back in with Moritz. The odd couple continued their sexual relationship, but shortly after her return to Moritz, Martha met a young engineering student by the name of Emil. Martha and Emil started a relationship or affair, and they kept it a secret. They did not have to be together in secret for long because wealthy businessman Moritz Fritz died of old age in 1924, and not only did he leave his mansion all for Martha, but he left her all of his money. This was promised to Martha well before Moritz died. Martha and Emil married soon after. They sold a lot of assets that Martha now owned, and they ran through their riches fairly fast. Their money was so low that they decided to take necessary measures in order to maintain the life of the rich and famous. Emil suggested that they would receive a lot of money through an insurance policy if he had an accident. They took out a $10,000 policy insuring Emil against accidents. Weeks after being insured, the couple decided that they would tell insurance Emil had an accident while trying to chop down a tree, which in turn caused him to lose a leg. The truth of the matter was that there was never any tree chopping, and Emil wanted Martha to do the chopping. Martha agreed to the crazy plan, and away with Emil's leg it was. Martha wasn't too strong and wasn't able to detach his leg from his body with one blow, so when insurance spoke with medical staff and saw pictures of the injuries, it looked deliberate. The medical staff would go on to say something along the lines of, The injury was caused by not one, but three separate blows, and the angles of the wounds were inconsistent with being struck by the alleged holder of the person attempting to cut down the tree. Martha even tried to bribe some of the medical staff into testifying that they saw the surgeon deliberately create additional wounds. One coroner's assistant accepted the bribe. The assistant demanded more money though, and when the couple was not able to pay up, they went to police. Emil and Martha were subsequently charged of bribery. The couple gained media attention and there was a public trial. Surprisingly, the public was in favor of the Marks because they felt the insurance company did not want to pay out. In April of 1927, after a protracted case, the courts found Martha and Emil guilty of bribing public officials, but not guilty of insurance fraud. They received a four-month jail sentence, but since they were in remand for four months, they spent no time in jail and were able to go home. The coroner's assistant, who was successfully bribed, received a six-week sentence. Since the insurance company lost their case, they settled with Martha and Emil and agreed to pay $3,000 but majority of the money was used for legal fees. The couple was struggling financially, and on top of everything, the couple had two children they were having a hard time taking care of. They ended up moving to Algeria because the cost of living was cheaper. The couple tried to start businesses in Algeria, but they all failed. They finally decided to return to Vienna. The family was so poor that Martha began selling vegetables in the streets. Emil, who never fully recovered from his amputation, grew sick, and ended up dying on July 31, 1932. It was an unexpected death, and doctors ruled his cause of death to be from tuberculosis. Because of their previous media attention, Martha made headline news again after her husband's death. To make matters worse, both of her daughters were growing ill and had the same symptoms as Emil before he passed. Just weeks after Emil died, 
their seven-year-old daughter Ingeborg passed away. Martha played the part of a grieving widow and mother. She was able to survive off of money she received from life insurance policies on her family members, and the community felt so bad for her that they started sending her monetary donations. The community felt bad for Martha, and one of her aunts, Suzanne Lowenstein, felt so bad that she appointed Martha as her sole heir. In 1934, shortly after Martha became heir of her second mansion, her aunt Suzanne passed away. Suzanne's symptoms were again eerily similar to Emile and Martha's daughters. Martha quickly ran out of her inheritance money, so she took in a person not only looking for a place to stay, but who was willing to pay rent. The lodger's name was Felicitas Kittenberger. Felicitas was living with Martha for a while, and she was eventually persuaded by Martha to take life insurance in her favor. Felicitas died shortly after the policy was put into action, and she had a funeral and was laid to rest. Felicitas' son grew suspicious of his mother's sudden death, so he filed charges and authorities agreed to begin an investigation. During the investigation, struggling Martha decided to hire someone to remove some of her dead aunt's expensive paintings from the house to a warehouse in the middle of the night in order to make it seem as if they were stolen. Martha then reported that the paintings were stolen and made an insurance claim for the missing artwork. The insurance company enlisted Detective Ignatz Peters to investigate the claim, and it just so happened to be that Detective Peters was the same detective who investigated Martha's previous insurance claim with her husband Emil's leg injury. Detective Peters automatically assumed Martha was guilty of fraud again. To top it off, Martha was getting greedy and she insured more valuables in her aunt's mansion and sold many art pieces to dealers. Some were the same art pieces she claimed were stolen. Detective Peters searched different warehouses in Vienna before finally stumbling upon the warehouse containing the hidden paintings. Martha was arrested and then sent to jail. Later on, authorities concluded that everyone close to Martha who passed away should be exhumed. After autopsies were conducted, it revealed that each victim died from zelio paste, which was readily available to anyone living in Austria. Each victim's limbs slowly became paralyzed and eventually their internal organs failed. Detective Peters remembered that Martha had another child. They found the boy, whose name was Alfonso, boarded out in a poor district in Vienna. He was safe, but they discovered that Martha had recently taken out a life insurance policy out on him, so he could have easily been her next victim because he was suffering from the same symptoms as Martha's previous victims. Thankfully, after being sent to the hospital, Alfonso was saved. All fingers pointed to Martha, and she was not able to blame anyone else because the chemist who sold her the paste was located. She still expressed her innocence, but at the conclusion of her trial, she was found guilty of killing four people and was sentenced to death. There was a moratorium on the death penalty in Austria, but Hitler had just taken over the government and reinstated the death penalty. After he reinstated the death penalty, on October 3, 1938, a new guillotine was sent to Vienna by rail and packaged as industrial machinery. At the time of Martha's sentence, no woman had been executed in Austria for over 30 years. While in prison, Martha claimed to be paralyzed and was unable to walk, so she was pushed around in a wheelchair. Her execution was set for December 6, 1938, and on the day of her execution, the executioner, Johann Reichardt, and his assistants practiced tipping the wheelchair Martha was using in front of the guillotine so that Martha would fall exactly on the right spot of the bench. Martha was then taken from her cell and placed in her wheelchair and was pushed by guards to her execution location. Martha's paralysis miraculously disappeared and she was kicking and fighting guards. She even kicked Johann Reichardt, but she was eventually subdued and restrained. There was no need for them to execute their practice of tipping the wheelchair now that they knew Martha could actually walk. Martha was finally executed, and she was one of 3,165 people that Johann executed between the years of 1924 and 1947. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Death Row Executions, and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and comment in the comment section below.